In the last few videos, we discussed how molecules can exist as multiple stereoisomers. And one of the key types of stereoisomers that we discussed were enantiomers, molecules that are related as non-superimposable mirror images. And they exist as non-superimposable mirror images because the molecule has one or more chiral centers that enable two structures to be related as mirror images that are not superimposable. For example, in the case of L-serine versus D-serine, these are building blocks of proteins. These are two amino acids. The L-serine has a chiral center right here where I've put the star because it has a NH2 group directly bonded, a CH2OH, a carboxylic acid, and then what's not shown as the missing part of the line angle formula is that there would be, drawn as a dash here, a hydrogen atom to fill out the tetrahedron. We know that that's a dash that would be filled in there because whatever part of a tetrahedron is missing is what has to be filled in as the implied hydrogen. So in a tetrahedron, if there's two lines and a wedge, what is missing would be the dash. On the other hand, if we had a dash that was filled in and no wedge, the wedge would be the missing part that we would have to fill in, such as is the case in the enantiomer, D-serine, where the hydrogen atom is the missing piece again, as is the case with all line angle formula, we imply that the hydrogen is there, and the hydrogen is implied to be on a wedge pointed toward us, rather than a dash pointed away from us, because of the fact that that is the missing piece of the detrimental. We have two lines in the page, one dash going away from us, and therefore the hydrogen has to be what's coming toward us from this chiral center that I'll mark off with a star here. Now, why do we call these L-serine and D-serine? has completely to do with the fact that they are enantiomers of one another. The L designation here refers to the rotation of polarized light toward the left or counterclockwise. So counterclockwise rotation of light On the other hand, D-serine is called such because it causes the clockwise rotation of light. And what will be the case of molecules that are related as enantiomers is if one molecule rotates polarized light by a certain degree counterclockwise or to the left, L, then the enantiomer of that the so-called D form that rotates like clockwise will rotate light clockwise to the same degree that the enantiomer rotates light in the other direction. So in other words, if the L isomer hypothetically rotates light counterclockwise by 15 degrees, the D isomer will rotate light clockwise by 15 degrees. And this was originally how the phenomenon of stereoisomers and enantiomers in particular was unveiled was that it was observed if a solution containing L-serine was subjected to plane polarized light, that the rotation of that light was opposite and equal to the rotation caused by the enantiomer of that molecule. And this particular instrument shown here with the tube that the scientist has placed into the instrument is the instrument that would be used to measure the rotation of light that is caused by different enantiomers. And still to this day, um, this is a very classic experiment in recognizing different enantiomers. Still to this day, this tool called a polarimeter is a useful way to go about evaluating the so-called stereochemistry of molecules, where stereochemistry is our evaluation of how the atoms are oriented in three-dimensional space. And to this day, commonly, amino acids are referred to as either the L form or the D form, where the D and L represent enantiomers of one another. And the biologically most relevant stereoisomer is the L form. The enantiomer, the D form, is produced by some bacteria, but is much, much, much less common and generally less of biological interest than the L form. So the 20 standard amino acids that are the building blocks of proteins and humans and most organisms are all the L form that rotate counterclockwise um, light. In this video, we are going to expand from looking just at the description of these molecules from the perspective of how do they rotate plane polarized light 
recognizing that L and D refer to enantiomers. And we are going to use a systematic way of describing the configuration or the shape of the chiral center using terminology called R and S. By the end of this video, you'll be comfortable with placing the term R or the term S at the beginning of the name of a molecule to describe the stereochemistry of the three-dimensional shape of each chiral center within a particular molecule. We described this information in the previous video, so we're not going to go into it in detail here, but what I want to draw your attention to is that the terminology used to describe these structures is the R and S terminology, where the structure on the left bottom here is described as R ibuprofen, the structure on the right is described as S, that tells us that those two are enantiomers of one another because the R and S forms of a molecule reflect that the two compounds are so-called enantiomers. Likewise, the two enantiomers of thalidomide are referred to as the R and the S, and naproxen, a leave, is also referred to as R and S. And so by the end of this video, rather than each of these structures being ambiguous about why we're calling one R and why we're being, calling one S, we will be able to systematically assess why we would describe one of those structures as R and why we would describe one as S using a very specific set of rules for assigning the RS configuration of molecules. So let's take a dive into that. How do we go about assigning chiral centers as R versus S? When we assign chiral centers as R versus S, what we will find is that the R and the S chiral centers represent enantiomer. So if one molecule has an R chiral center and the other has an S chiral center, that's the only chiral center in the molecule, the two structures must be enantiomers of one another. So this system, in addition to providing us a way to describe in words a particular structure and how the atoms are oriented in three-dimensional space, it also gives us a way to readily recognize whether two molecules that we're looking at are enantiomers or not. Because if the two molecules have one chiral center each, and that chiral center we can assign as R in one of the structures and S in the other, then we know that the two compounds must be enantiomers. So to assign the stereochemistry or the chiral centers in each molecule as R versus S, how we will go about doing that is using this series of steps. And what I'm going to do is walk through an example as we do this. So I'm going to draw the example problem up here in the upper right corner, where we're going to have a chiral carbon that's bonded to a bromine in the plane of the page shown as a line, a fluorine atom shown as a line as well in the plane of the page, a chlorine atom, and this is a wedge that I'm currently drawing here, a wedge points out of the page toward you. And we're going to put a chlorine on that bond. And then finally, to finish off the tetrahedral shape of this carbon, I'm going to put a hydrogen atom there pointed away from me on a dash. The dash points away into the page like it's going off into the sunset away from us. So how do we go about assigning these chiral carbons as R versus S? Let's go ahead and take this in a step-by-step -step manner. The first thing that we're going to do is rank or prioritize each of the groups that are bonded to that chiral center. So rank each group that's bonded at the chiral center. So we find the chiral center in the molecule, specifically that chiral carbon, a carbon with four different groups bonded to it. So that's our carbon right here that's bonded to chlorine, fluorine, bromine, and hydrogen. If the carbon is not bonded to four different groups, then we will not be able to assign it as RS. It is neither R nor S. The terminology is irrelevant. So rank each group bonded to the chiral center. The way that we rank is based on atomic number. Atoms with a higher atomic number are going to rank higher. So for this exercise, it's handy to have your periodic table out so that you can refer to that as needed. I'm going to go ahead and pull up our periodic table here. So I've zoomed into the periodic table so that we can see each of the atoms that are shown in our diagram here in our molecular structure. We have bromine, chlorine, fluorine, and hydrogen over here in the far left corner. 
looking at the atomic number of each of these atoms, we see that bromine has the largest atomic number, followed by chlorine, followed by fluorine, followed by hydrogen. And so to rank each of those groups that are bonded to that chiral carbon, I'm just going to come over here and put a number on them where bromine had the highest atomic number. So I'm going to rank that as number one. Chlorine was second highest, so I rank that as number two. Fluorine as number three, and hydrogen as number four. Now that we have ranked those, I will add an addendum here that we may run into at times, which is if the atom directly bonded to the chiral center is tied, for example, in two different directions, you have a carbon atom, then what we do is we go down the chain one more spot until we find an atom that differs between the two. So if atoms directly bonded to the chiral center are identical, then we move one more spot down the chain until we find a spot that differs. So if atoms directly bonded to the chiral carbon are identical, move one position down the chain to break the tie. And it's still going to be once we've moved down the chain that the higher atomic number is going to turn out to be the winner. And we could move multiple spots down the chain if we needed to until we are able to break that tie. If we reach the very end of the chain and we still haven't broken the tie, that would indicate to us that the two groups that are bonded are identical and that therefore what we thought was a chiral carbon is actually not a chiral carbon because we have to have groups that overall are different. They might have the same carbon atom bonded initially to the chiral center, such as would be the case if you had a methyl group versus an ethyl group bonded to the chiral center. But in those cases, you would have different chain lengths and you would be able to recognize what, what point the groups became different. And we'll do an example of that as we get further on here. So if the atoms directly bonded to the chiral carbon are identical, move another position down the chain until you get to a point where you can break the tie so that you can assign rankings one through four. Second step of determining whether a structure is R or S is the molecule needs to be rotated so that the lowest ranked group points away from you. In other words, the lowest ranked group must be on a dash. So rotate so the lowest ranked group is on a dash. In other words, it points away from you. And for purposes of an introduction to R and S assignments, you'll be provided with molecules that have the hydrogen or whatever the lowest ranked group is already pointed away from you on a dash, such as is the case here. We will save for more advanced classes situations where you would need to rotate the molecule around. So we'll assume that step two here is taken care of, but it's always good to verify the lowest rank group is on a dash. Now what we're going to do to determine whether the molecule will be described as the R or the S enantiomer at this particular chiral center is we're going to draw a circle connecting number one to number two to number three. And we will determine whether that circle goes clockwise or counterclockwise. If the circle goes clockwise to accomplish going from one to two to three, we describe the stereoisomer as having the R configuration, R meaning to the right or clockwise. Clockwise is right. If instead it goes counterclockwise, we would describe the configuration instead as S. So you could think of this as R is the right way for a clock to move. In other words, clockwise is described as R because R is the right way for a clock to move. S is the stupid way for a clock to move. It is the reverse of the way that a clock normally moves. It is a counterclockwise movement. So taking a look at our structure here, we start at number one. I'm gonna connect that to number two and then connect number two to number three, you'll notice we're going clockwise here. And therefore, we would describe this as the R configuration at that particular chiral center. And if we were to write out the full IUPAC name for this particular molecule, including the configuration, the way that we would do that is we would put at the very beginning of the name, the term R, and you'll see that sometimes 
in parentheses, sometimes with just a dash connecting it to the rest of the name for the molecule, and then you would see the rest of the name for that particular compound as our way of indicating whether it is R or S and incorporating that into the IUPAC name of the molecule. Now, if we were looking at this structure and we saw another one that we suspected might be the enantiomer, we weren't really sure, what we could do is assign the configuration of this structure as R or S, assign the other one as R or S, and if one of them was R and the other one was S, we would know that they are enantiomers because R versus S structures are related as enantiomers. If a molecule has one chiral center in it, one of those is R, and then for the stereoisomer of that, you find that that one chiral center in the molecule is S, the two structures are so-called enantiomers of one another. So for enantiomers, one enantiomer will always be R, and the other one will always be S at that particular chiral carbon. Let's go ahead and do some example problems in the next video that follows up from this.